Uh, I wear a lot of hats, as you can see, and uh, this is an exciting time. So I'm going to jump in, and we're going to go really fast. I have a lot of uh, things to say. Um, so let's just go ahead. So uh, I published my first book, um, and my first book was in both print and electronic form in 1992, uh, and pretty much nobody cared. Um, I mean, it sold 40,000 copies in print form, and there was a CD-ROM in the back of every one, and I don't think more than two of them were taken out. Um, the world just really was not ready yet. And this wasn't just my experience. There was a lot of interesting stuff going on in exploring multimedia, interactive media products, and it kind of fizzled out. Um, uh, you know, and there were a number of reasons why that happened. Um, you know, even if this had been technically possible to do, uh, who wants to read a book on a big desktop thing or even a laptop, uh, there were big problems with distribution economics. How do you sell something for $10 that you have to actually physically mail? Um, and then the internet came along and essentially gave away for free a lot of what people had been trying to sell uh, in that form. Um, not to mention, so I did the math. If the elements uh, iPad app had come on floppy disks, it would be 4,250 floppy disks. Um, so there were difficulties. Um, so uh, you know what I did was what a lot of people did. We, we worked on uh, uh, building software instead. Um, so I'm a co-founder, as you said, of Wolfram Research. We've been, um, you know, I've been working on Mathematica for 22 years, almost 23 years. Um, and this is a very widely used piece of software uh, for technical computing. It's also a platform for electronic publishing. Uh, since long before that was fashionable. Um, uh, it, you know, it remains to this day an unparalleled tool for uh, exploration and discovery. Um, and it turns out that's actually quite a useful thing if you want to, to, to be an ebook author these days. Um, but let me get to the reason why I'm actually here, uh, why I've been invited, I'm pretty sure, um, which is my sort of little personal journey, journey in e-publishing. E um, which started with this book, Uncle Tungsten by Oliver Sacks. It's a wonderful book, highly recommended. Um, uh, and in this book, he talks about a periodic table display in the Kensington Science Museum, which he used to visit as a child. And I thought he was talking about a table, like an actual table that you could, and, and he said there were elements on this table, on this periodic table. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. I want to go see that. Uh, and it turns out it's on the wall. I was just confused when I was reading it. It's just the wall display of the elements. Um, and I was so disappointed, I thought this needs to be fixed. Uh, because apparently, as far as I could tell, there was no periodic table table anywhere in the world. Um, so I built one. Um, and uh, it has little compartments under the, the tiles to put elements in. And so uh, about a year later, it looked like this. And a little while later, it looked like that. Uh, eBay is a powerful thing um, <laughs> if you want weird stuff. Wow. Um, so this is Oliver Sacks, who came to visit my periodic table, um, which his confusing writing inspired. Uh, and he had a good time there, I think. Um, this is the 2002 Ig Nobel Prize in Chemistry. If you're not familiar, this is awarded by the Journal for Irreproducible Results for uh, achievements that cannot or should not be repeated. Um, um, this is uh, the website that I put together. Uh, fairly soon after building the table because, you know, it was the, the early 2000s and I had an unusual collecting hobby. So it's kind of pretty much required by law that you have a website to highlight that hobby. Um, and I started out with uh, periodictabletable.com because that's all I could get. And then uh, eventually I graduated to a much higher rent district, periodictable.com, a very nice uh, URL, which I felt deserved a better, uh, a better looking website. Um, and I put a huge amount of effort into this. Uh, and uh, as is the experience of anybody who's done that, I didn't make really any money on it. Uh, I mean, it's a lot of work, and you put up a lot of good material, and you spend a lot of time writing and photographing, and you put up Google ads, and you know, you just don't make a lot of money. So I did what uh, many people did, um, and, and still do, which is to cash in um, by publishing a print book. Um, so this this book uh, is, um, you know, a very fine book. I don't want to say anything bad about print books. It's published by a fabulous publisher, Black Dog and Leventhal. You should go out and buy it. It's a great book. Hi, Becky. Um, and uh, you know, it's got beautiful two-page spreads for all the elements. Some of the popular ones have two two-page spreads. Um, and this was, this was vastly more financially rewarding than uh, a website. We've sold 320,000 copies in 17 languages since September 09, right? So that's pretty good. Um, but it's still somehow unsatisfying 
to uh, be required to go to paper in order to uh, earn money on what is essentially an electronic production. This, you know, I've always thought of this as a website um, which has been published in book form. Um, although the book has lots of stuff that's not on the web too, but whatever. Um, but there just wasn't any, there wasn't any alternative. Uh, you, you get laughed off the web if you try to charge for this kind of content. Um, but then, then Steve Jobs came down, down from on high on some kind of a cloud and gave us this device. Um, hi, Chris. Uh, um, you know, and it's amazing. He gave us a device and a marketplace where it was finally possible. You know, people want to buy this stuff. There's a way to sell it. Um, there's a, 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 a philosophy of, well, you know, you ought to buy it. You could, you could steal it, but let's not. Just buy it, um, which is an amazing thing uh, to have created it from a sort of sociological point of view. Um, and, and, you know, the minute I saw this announcement, uh, which was in February, I immediately thought, you know, here it is. This is the thing. I have what I need. I have all the raw material. Um, you know, I'm sitting on a book that's been finished. All the text has been written, beautifully edited. Um, I, have a, I have all these rotating objects, which you could rotate if they were in electronic form, as opposed to the print book, where we had to pick one view out of 720 for every object. Um, and, and not only that, we've given two months' warning in which to do it, an entire 60 days um, to, you know, invent a new style of electronic book. Um, and I had a pretty good idea what I wanted to do, but unfortunately there are no tools for doing that. Um, and uh, so, you know, so we put, to, uh, put together a little schedule. First we invent what it should be, and then we invent the tools to create it with, and then we use those tools to create it. Uh, Somewhere along the line, we decided that it really needed to have a theme song, which if we have time at the end, I'll play you that. Um, and then we convinced Apple that they really loved this thing and that they should uh, help us promote it. Uh, and then we invented the company to be the publisher of it, uh, which is called Touch Press, um, in, the, in about a week before it was released. And then we submitted it to the Apple store and, and hold our breath and make a lot of phone calls. Um, and, uh, and, and there you go. So. Uh, and Apple responded beautifully and put it on all the preview iPads that they sent out to journalists, and, um, and that was great. Um, so here, here's an example, by the way, of uh, what I mean by making tools, right? There, there are no tools for creating books like this, and the book couldn't be created without tools. So the first step was use Mathematica, which I happen to be familiar with, to create an interactive page layout program for laying out rotatable objects where you, you, know, you drag the objects on and then you can position them not only in, you know, move them around or zoom them, but also rotate them to get the perfect composition of the page. And then push a button and have it create uh, the sort of spin down movies that you see on each page where all the objects in a concerted way come together and, and pose in their hero positions. Um, all of that is completely automated. There simply wasn't time for human beings to be involved in the production of the final files that go into the book. That had to be done by a computer, and the only way to do that was to write the code to do it first. Um, and that was only possible because we were using Mathematica, which is an extremely efficient environment for doing that sort of um, processing. Um, so, so everything in the app, every single pixel on the screen, every movie, every rotating image, every word of text is generated by Mathematica code based on databases and templates and uh, custom code. Um, and, and we got it done you know, in the 60 days. Um, so uh, this turned out to be worthwhile. So the print book uh, has sold really well. Uh, the ebook has sold really well. Um, and for those of you in the print publishing industry, I don't have to tell you how much higher the margins are uh, in an electronic world. You know, we have no warehouses. Apple takes 30%, which is uh, really quite fair, I think. Uh, you know, compare that to what, to what people take for print books, and it's a really good deal. Plus, you have no warehouses, no printing costs, no, no nothing. Um, uh, this, this, you know, this has kind of caused us to think, well, maybe we should do this again. Um, and uh, so we decided that we should probably invent a company that sounded like we might want to do this again. Um, so we came up with Touch Press and um, sort of hung out a shingle uh, at, at that URL. Um, and basically the mandate of Touch Press is uh, to, to find out what books can be in the future. Uh, there's many different ideas of what they could be, and we're like we're exploring that possi you know the, the possibilities and the space of possible futures for books. Um, 
And there's basically our philosophy boils down to that there's three elements that we think you need to produce a really interesting new, new world electronic interactive title. Um, the first thing you need is an author, a real author, not a writer, a technical writer or something, not somebody that you just kind of hire on contract, but uh, someone who can tell a real story, who can kind of give depth and humor and authority and bring it all together uh, and turn it into a book. Uh, something you might actually want to read even if it weren't interactively uh, electronic. Um, and this is something that traditional print publishers completely understand. You know, they know that authors are the beginning and end of every book. Uh, but software companies and multimedia companies often don't understand this at all. Um, the second thing you need is real programmers. Uh, and since I'm an Apple fan, these are all the original Mac developers. Um, uh, not, you know, flash hackers or somebody you hire for a $5,000 flat rate fee or something like that. You need the people who turn the hardware into magic, the, the people who make it do things that nobody else can make it do. Um, you know, video game companies understand this deeply, that they live and die by the quality of their development teams. Um, but print publishers, frankly, don't always understand that. Um, the third thing you need, uh, we feel, is uh, basically the television producer's eye for visuals and ability to create visual imagery and, and moving imagery um, efficiently, on budget, on schedule, um, and at very high quality. Uh, I like to think of it like cut scenes. You know, in, in, in video games, everyone complains about the cut scenes, which are a little animated sequence, because you know, they get in the way and they're boring and they're not very good. Um, Avatar is a two-hour cut scene, but it's one that's so good that you actually watch the whole thing all the way through. Right? It's, it's not a question of do you have video, it's a question of do you have video that you'd watch even if it was just the video. You know, so what you need to have is text that you'd read even if it was printed on paper, visuals, imagery, video that you would watch even if it was a TV program, and code that you would use even if it was, you know, even if you didn't have those other elements, if it was just a game. Uh, and if you can put those three things together, then uh, you have something really interesting. So that's sort of the, the, uh, where TouchPress is coming from, is uh, let's do all those things and put together people with those backgrounds. So TouchPress is myself uh, and Stephen Wolfram from a software background uh, and, and publishing, uh, and Max Whitby in the middle here, uh, who is a former BBC television producer who has very deep experience and, and beautifully deep Rolodex of people uh, in the television business. Um, so uh, I'm gonna try to show you now uh, our second title. Um, we had 60 days to do the elements, and this is what we could do given a little more time. This was released just before Christmas. Uh, if we could switch over here um, to the projector here. There we go. Okay, unfortunately, the, the uh, resolution of this projector is not ideal. Is it lined up even, or did we not do that? How's that? There we go, that's probably good enough. Right, so this is the solar system. It's a book about the solar system. Um, and it has some of the same elements um, as uh, the elements book. Um, but, you know, we've advanced the technology. So we now have OpenGL, zoomable, rotatable objects. Um, we have nicely integrated video on the page. Um, we have, uh, let me see, I particularly like Deimos here. Uh, sort of a potato of a moon, uh, which is in orbit around Mars. And um, turns out this thing is, it's so small, you, you, you can stand on it, but just barely. And uh, if you jump really hard, you could actually jump off it. Um, and I've been having an extended debate with some astronomy people about whether you, whether you could actually um, jump off the moon and onto Mars. Like, could you jump off and parachute down onto Mars? Um, it's not clear you could do that or not, but uh, it'd be kind of fun if you could. Um, and speaking of Mars, uh, another thing we've got here is uh, a lot of absolutely amazing imagery. This is, in theory, you know, all this is available from NASA, but somehow when you see it all put together, uh, especially when you see it actually at high resolution on this screen, um, it, it's really amazing. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's considerably more amazing on a better screen than what you're seeing, but anyway. Um, so that's one example of what we've been doing. And uh, let me go back here. Um, we can switch back. 
Yeah, and if we can have sound now, there we go. Right, so as I was saying, one of the things we decided at some point was that, that e-books ought to have theme songs. Um, so like I say, at the very end, I may play you a, 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 the, the Elements theme song. This is a theme song from a solar system. It's a, 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 a composition by Bjork uh, from a, a, her forthcoming album, um, which turned out to be very uh, sort of appropriate for solar system. Um, so uh, yeah, there we go. Um, moving along. So we're basically operating like a production company um, in the sense of a television or movie production company. So we have multiple teams working on multiple titles um, that uh, you're going to see coming out in, in future months. Um, and even though our first two titles, Elements and Solar System, are very much science oriented, um, we're really not a science publishing or publisher or even a, a nonfiction publisher. Uh, we are concentrating on a, a particular sort of visual style, a particular type of book, classy, you know, coffee table photo book type things, uh, books for everyone, not, you know, textbooks. Um, there's a certain tendency to focus on, on uh, nonfiction because uh, we're, we have, you know, we want to have a lot of visual pictures of real things. Um, and um, so we're also kind of some, somewhat struggling with the question of whether we pre-announce pre these things. I mean, print, print publishers tend to tell you about their books a year before they're actually printed. Uh, software companies tend to, to consider it a, uh, you know, a strategic thing to not tell you about what we're doing. Um, so we're kind of, we're kind of we, we go in between and we tease people uh, and show them things but don't actually tell them um, what we're doing. So you know, we're working on some interesting things. Um, uh, we're working with some, some big name authors to, to write about these interesting things. Um, for some reason, we're not seeing the interesting things. There we go. Yes, that's much more interesting than me. Um, it's a two-headed cow, and it's going to be a great book. Um, <laughs> but um, there is one title that, that we're sort of officially announcing um, today. Uh, it's not, not published yet, but this is a, a, a title developed in partnership with Faber and Faber, uh, who's T.S. Eliot's original publisher and, and uh, um, uh, a very good custodian of his work. Um, and this is a, a, um, an ebook on this classic text. And we think it's really going to sort of set a new standard for how you interact with these classic texts, how you make them into interactive things. Um, it has uh, a, um, a total of five recordings of this poem, um, uh, two by Eliot himself at different stages in his life, uh, one by Alec Guinness. And this particularly amazing performance by Fiona Shaw uh, which we, we you know, sent a crew out to record it in Ireland. Um, uh, if you don't know who Fiona Shaw is, my daughter immediately recognized her as Aunt Petunia in the latest Harry Potter movie. Um, but I think this kind of shows, uh, and it will start up in a second here, um, uh, why it is that you, you want to have TV people involved with producing these things, because this, well, you'll see. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us coming over the Starnberger Day with a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the Hof Garden and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Bin gar keine Huschestam, ausgetreut, echt Deutsch. And when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousin. He took us out in a sleigh, and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains, there you feel free. Well, anyway, um, I could watch that. You know, if that were on TV. <clears throat> if, if, if that were a half hour show on the BBC, I'd probably watch it. Um, but instead, it's one element in an interactive text where you can see that the text of the poem synchronized with the video. You can, you can move your fingers up and down on the text and the video tracks. Um, you know, and, and you can read all about the, what each of these different lines means. And here it's spoken in four, you know, five different voices, maybe six if we can get an American to read it properly. Um, 
not easy. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, we have, I think, some quite interesting things coming out. Um, one thing that, that we're quite clear about, though, is that we're not a textbook company, even though our materials are you know, quite educational and quite relevant to, uh, to the interests of students and parents. Um, what we produce is enrichment materials. Uh, they're the kind of stuff that you'd find in the school library that the kids would go and check out because it's actually interesting, um, as opposed to the textbook that they've been assigned. Um, and one reason for that is that um, I don't think there's a future in, in paying for ordinary textbooks. Uh, I think the, 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 you know, and I realize who I'm talking to here, but I think, you know, thank you for making it economically possible to buy an iPad instead of a couple of textbooks. Um, that, you know, the, the, that pricing model has made it possible for that model to be replaced by one in which the delivery mechanism is electronic and uh, the textbooks are basically free because they're produced by professors who are perfectly happy to do this kind of stuff for free and who, who uh, you know, really were only going through publishers because they don't know how to go to China and get print runs arranged and uh, deal with container ships full of paper coming back. Um, I think, you know, simple, static, straightforward textbooks are going to be produced as open source projects with, you know, Kariki or other such projects uh, dealing with all the issues there. Um, uh, I think what people will pay for, though, is really interesting stuff, the kind of stuff that requires, um, you know, more extensive production expertise and time and money put into it. And particularly, they'll pay for interactivity as well, um, deep and interesting interactivity. Uh, so this comes in many different forms. And there's many different people out there uh, building different kinds of interactivity. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, Inkling, I think, is an interesting example of building uh, teacher-student communication into their products. Uh, that's a, a form of interactivity that I think schools will pay for. Um, we're doing other things. So uh, the three hats that I wear, Touch Press, Wolfram Research, Wolfram Alpha, um, each of them uh, contribute different kinds of interactivity to, you know, into this mix. Um, so for example, Wolfram Alpha is built into the Elements app. And I should mention that, that all these entities are also uh, shareholders in Touch Press, so we're kind of like a little family. Um, uh, well, the Elements has Wolfram Alpha built in. This is a library that is linked into the Elements app. And when you touch any of the physical properties in there, it brings up a little Wolfram Alpha window and tells you lots more about it. Like, for example, the current price of gold. This is, a, unfortunately, a screen that was um, produced a couple months ago, so the price is actually out of date there. But if we were doing this on the actual iPad, it would be the, you know, the current exchange traded market price of, uh, of gold, you know, 15 minute delayed or whatever, um, which is something that's very, very easy to do uh, using the Wolfram Alpha technology. Um, and this is, you know, something we're very interested in licensing to anybody who might have a book that might have technical content or fact-based content that might want to be able to produce that sort of depth easily. Uh, we're also using it to produce a series of, of what we call course apps, which we just released quite recently. Um, uh, course assistant apps. Uh, and uh, these are very lightweight things. All the computation is done in the cloud. Um, you know, so here, for example, it's doing an integral and, and, and showing the steps for how you might do this if you were a human, um, in case you needed to write this down to show that you know how to do it or something like that. Um, there is a certain aspect of guerrilla education reform in there, but anyway. Um, I would call it calculator-like interface, except calculators are actually incredibly hard to use in comparison. Um, and actually, the most important thing about these apps is not so much exactly what they do, but the fact that they're very, very easy for us to produce, and we're going to make a whole bunch of them. Because they're basically, all the hard stuff is done in the cloud using the Wolfram Alpha engine behind it. Uh, so the other thing I really want to tell you about is uh, the thing that we are even more recently announcing, the, the computable document format, CDF. Um, this is basically the current incarnation of what I've been working on for almost 23 years. Uh, it's been through many, many iterations, um, and it's a very, very deep technology based on Mathematica uh, that's intended for publication of interactive technical documents, uh, scientific papers, textbooks, things like that. Um, uh, so um, you know, this is an example of a courseware that was introduced 
uh, in the early 90s, calculus and mathematica. It remains to this day, I think, one of the most interesting examples of interactive calculus materials, which is kind of a sad thing, actually, that, uh, that it's still one of the most interesting ones. Um, and it's based on Mathematica, and it's deeply interactive because Mathematica really understands calculus, and it is able to interact with the student at a very sophisticated level. Um, and we had, you know, we had very high hopes back in 1992 or three that this kind of stuff was going to actually, you know, filter out into the world and become uh, an important force in education, and it didn't, uh, for more or less the same reasons that that uh, you know my books never really happened in electronic form back then. Um, but things are different uh, this time around. The world really is ready. And uh, we're here with this technology. Um, so an example of that, um, I think in the interest of time, I won't actually show it to you as a live example. Um, uh, recently released uh, Briggs Cochran Calculus textbook published by Pearson, um, which is a, a standard print calculus textbook, but also a completely electronic interactive textbook based on the CDF technology. Um, it has. Uh, something like 600 diagrams like this, which if I were to switch out and fiddle around a bit, you could actually you know, move the sliders, click on the graph, check the checkboxes, everything interactive. 600 of these, which if you think about it, is really kind of an astonishing number. Uh, which, and they were created by one guy kind of in, in, in less than a year, um, just you know, working in an author-like way. Uh, to do this using other technologies would be just, uh, you know, completely prohibitive, uh, the, the amount of time and effort required to create that number of sophisticated computationally interactive diagrams, just you know, forget it. But we've been working on this stuff for a very long time, building up the, the stack of technologies that you need in order to make these things very easy to create. Um, and we would really you know, love to license it to anybody else that has uh, textbooks that they would like to have made interactive this way. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, we have essentially a complete suite of tools from the you know, development environment, authoring environment, content creation tools, whatever you call it, to uh, runtime environments to deploy this in desktop systems through web browsers, um, and, and no comment about iPad at this point. Um, but that would be really cool. Uh, so uh, just sort of to summarize, um, TouchPress is a publishing company. We often partner with other publishing companies, as for example with, with uh, Black Dog and Leventhal and with Faber and Faber and others. Um, we're interested in bringing really interesting content to the iPad platform uh, in you know, exciting and innovative ways. Uh, talk to us if you have an interesting project. Uh, Wolfram Research is a technology company. Um, we create tools and platforms. We're not a publisher. Uh, and we license those tools to people who are publishers. So if you need a solution for uh, sophisticated, deep technical interactivity uh, in, in electronic documents, uh, uh, talk to Wolfram Research. Um, so thank you, visit us at 306. And I believe I have two minutes, two minutes, in which to play you the theme song from the Elements app, um, which is the, uh, not the normal one. So you probably have seen the, Probably many of you have heard Tom Lehrer's 1959 classic recording of the song The Elements, um, which is just an amazing piece of work. I traded him an iPad for the rights to put that in uh, my iPad app. Uh, but this is, this is not that. Uh, this is the Japanese translation of that song, um, because we've sold a heck of a lot of these things in Japan, and I felt they really deserved to have uh, a proper Japanese version. So somebody on YouTube uh, described this as disembodied fembot heads, and I thought, yes, that's what I was going for. Um, some people can't stand this thing, but I think it's really cool. And you can either buy the Japanese version of the, of the app, or it is actually on YouTube if you search for Tom Lehrer Japanese. Oh, that's her twin sister. She sings harmony. <laughs> These are actually my first cousins once removed. It turns out I didn't really realize this, but I have a cousin who's a lounge singer in Osaka. He's lived there for 20 years, and he plays piano in fancy hotel bars. So, uh, and his daughters sing, so, you know.
All right, maybe that's enough. Um, all right, thank you very much.